Brand new minted corporate C CISO in a role. Mm -hmm. Third day on the job, I get to sit down with the CEO. Five minutes into the conversation, I'm stopped dead in my discussion with, look, I don't even actually know why we have this role here. Like, what is it that we actually need to focus on security for? Why do we need a CISO? got to stay positive in this stuff right you can't you can't get negative it's like the role of the CISO you have to be <laughs> un, like just uncharacteristically optimistic about what's going to happen because your job is to just deal with bad right yeah <laughs> I, I try to learn from my dog uh in this regard the dog has never been handed a treat from the uh, dining room table at dinner time ever in his life but every night that doesn't stop him from coming up, <laughs> sitting down, making puppy eyes, wagging his tail and hoping for the best. He's still trying. That's good. <laughs> he is a perennial optimist. And, uh, you know, yeah, that's that's how we should all be. Right. Yeah. Just because we didn't get the treat today, we might get it tomorrow. <laughs> right. Keep shooting for it. Keep going. Might as well. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, man. Well, so I'm glad we got this. We got this set up. Um, we were going to talk for an hour, so so I want to be respectful. You got family time. You got stuff to do. You got a dog to go take care of. I got a wife right. and daughter that are uh, happily letting me skip. Uh, we're doing breakfast for dinner tonight, so we're. Nice. Um, I love breakfast for dinner. Yeah, it's a real thing. It's a real thing, people. Yes, it is. It's a real thing. Yes, it is. <laughs> It's a common thing around here. At least once every two weeks, we do it. Oh my God, I miss Waffle House or like just yeah, you know. 11 o'clock at night and grabbing pancakes somewhere because of exactly of, because you can because you can yeah <laughs> again we'll get back to that if that if that is anybody's motivation out there to make this all go faster so that you can have pancakes at 11 o'clock on an ihop with your friends make that your motivation <laughs> i like it i like it so we wanted to um the idea for this show we wanted to talk about you and i were talking about war stories from being a CISO yeah. and uh um, you know, I'm a fan, I'm a NIST fanboy. So, um, right. we were talking about like, man, like what, yeah, war stories are cool. And we all kind of like talk about those at conferences and we all meet up and, and do about that. Like you couldn't believe this happened or that happened, but, um, wouldn't it be nice to be able to learn from like, well, where, where should I have looked to make sure that that maybe didn't happen? Like, so you and I were talking about, well, how, like, if we think back, what would have the NIST control that we would have implemented to have kept that from happening? So uh, that right, was the premise. Right. Are you still good with that? I'm still good with that. I was, you know, I was thinking of it in terms of like NIST controls I've attempted to implement and then something got in the way, right? right. Some lesson learned that it's like, oh, okay. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's the right focus. I think, I think CSF is a brilliant framework and I'm, I don't think I'm quite the CSF fanboy you are because I, I live in ISO land quite a lot too. Um, Nothing wrong but, with that. Uh, but, at, oh. but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you know, we have to have frameworks. We have to have sets of controls. We have to have some sort of paradigm and operating model. And what I love best about CSF is that, you know, people see it as this linear list of, you know, spreadsheet columns, you know, rows one through 100 or whatever, 180 total 100, controls. 108. 108. Used there to be 98 up until last year. And now right. it's 108. Yeah. yeah. One dot one. It's 108 now. Yeah. Shout out to Ron, um, shout still, out to Ron Ross and the good people at NIST. Ron, thank you. You and the entire team, keep up the good work. Hey, two thumbs up here for real. Two thumbs up. This is uh, NIST is so valuable. And the one thing I always like to remind people is, even though you read it as the spreadsheet rows one to one hundred and eight, mm. um, the important thing to remember is it's a cycle. It's a process. It's not an. It's not something that ends. It's not finite. You don't punch through all hundred and eight and clap your hands and walk away and go get your next CISO job. It doesn't work that way. No. Um, and so iterating through it and learning how to iterate through it more effectively, learning how to walk the iterations with the business in partnership with the business, I think is one of the single biggest challenges we face. And and I think CSF, you know, grab grab whatever framework you like. Well, tonight we're talking about CSF. The biggest challenges I've had with NIST and the biggest failings I've had as a CISO, the biggest lessons learned I've had as a CISO have not been anything intrinsic to the framework itself, but have been intrinsic to the process of integration with the business. Right. Oh, every yeah. time you read a control, you have to have that, well, how does this apply to the business? Because if you're only mm -hmm. applying NIST or any NIST control set to an IT-centric cybersecurity siloed version of how you're supposed to do something, you're totally missing the picture of how it's supposed exactly. to operate and go across. And my view is you bubble it up to 
risk management, right? It's like the business yeah. risk management at the high level, and then you use the NIST to bring forward and bring mm -hmm. up the cyber controls that are going to be meaning. They're going to create meaningful conversations with the business later on, or exactly, it, whatever exactly. It is. And and one of the biggest failings, I think. In, in interpretation of NIST is everyone looks at ID-BE and, and thinks like, oh, that's the containment for that paradigm right there. Like, oh, it's all neatly contained in the BE section. No, 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 no. It's an overlay for the whole shooting match. Yep. You better have BE done. You better understand everything in ID-BE. Um, you better understand all that, but but it's an overlay that that has to be there for every step of the process, every every control, all 108. Yep. Um, you, you need to have that business focus in mind. And, and I like, I like your model. I think, I think I've seen a, a variety of, of models in that regard, but in my mind, you know, business terms come first, risk terms come second, cyber terms come third, hmm. right? Start like with that. an awareness of the business, start with an awareness of the business, start with what the heck is the business mission. And this is what BE gets to is how does what I'm trying to do here under these controls, how does this tie into and fit the greater business. What is the greater business? What the heck is our mission as an organization? What are we even doing here on planet Earth? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's understand that deeply and fundamentally. Then let's understand risk from a business perspective. And then let's bring in cyber. And if you treat it that way and put yourself third in line, basically as the CISO, um, you know, third third in line in the sense that, that business is first, risk is second, you're third. Um, that's really the only healthy approach I think we can take. And I think any CISO who comes with a cyber forward argument to the business is going to ultimately be met with failure of some kind. Uh, either his message won't be received. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll he'll prioritize the wrong things. And in the long run, the bad thing will happen uh, around what he built. Um, there's, a, there's a number of reasons that can fail, but I really think that's the model. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's amazing how many of us miss that point and still push forward thinking that we're going to change it because what's the old it's like the old adage like security doesn't exist because of the or the business doesn't exist because of security right security yeah. exists for the business like we're not there yes. for the reason and i know a lot of us think we're cool or the coolest guy walking in the room because we understand the magic that is cybersecurity that a lot of people look at but we're not there just to be there we're there because yep. of the larger picture the goal of the organization um, you know, and this is a, this is a, a thing that my dad taught me early on um, working in insurance. Uh, he, he came out of that space was like a, a business's role and job is to make money. Like no matter mm -hmm. how you look at it, that is its goal. There's altruistic yep. versions and, and good natured stuff. All fine. I get that. But if if the goal of the business is to not make money, it's not going to be a very successful business. So if a CISO right. doesn't recognize that that's why they're there, to support that mission ultimately, and then all the other ancillary nice-to-haves, because they are kind of mm -hmm. nice-to-haves, mm -hmm. then they're going to, I think they're going to fail in the role that they're charged with in protecting the, you know, the, the company as a whole. Um, yep. And I might be wrong. I, I don't know. You sound like you're agreeing with me, but like I've definitely have some people who are like, "Oh, you're you're looking at it like kind of way too." You're not cynical, are you, Brian? I'm like, no, I'm I'm a realist. Like, a, yep. a business exists for a reason. So, and 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 even if you even if you deviate from that model a little bit and branch out into say public sector and whatever else there might be, uh, yeah. another way that you can put it is the mission. Right. Mission. Every matters. organization has a declared mission. Right. Right. Whatever that mission might be, it could be it could be the military's mission is to protect the country. It could be the library's mission is to get the most books out to the public, you know, as they can, given the budget they have. Well, right. every every organization has a mission. And in the case of the private sector, yeah, that mission is make money. Right. That is the mission. Yep. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter because mission comes first and then comes risk, which is a discipline far older than cyber. Mm -hmm. um, it's been measured, quantified, understood, calculated. You know, there were actuary tables long before there were computers. Um, <laughs> and I think that uh, I, I think that cyber is is third in line, partially because of that, even. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a discipline that was here before us. And I think a lot of us as cyber practitioners, it, it's ironic to me that we we frequently complain you know um there's there's a great analogy out there and i can't remember who gets credit for it but it's it's gone around so many times at this point i think it's kind of public domain the idea that uh, 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 being a CISO is the same thing as uh 
being an accountant before general accounting practices were invented, right? Being a <laughs> yeah. CFO before general accounting practices were invented. And we lament that as CISOs, that it's like, gee, we're, we're inventing our own discipline as we go. We're, we're, we're creating our own craft as we, you know, we're building the bicycle as we ride it. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent that is true, but to a certain extent, it's because we think we're special that right. we're having to go through that. Right. If we look at business first, we look at risk second, we look at ourselves third, it's amazing how much of it actually slots in without having to build the bicycle. Yeah, yeah, we're not special, right? It's, it's, it, it is the, um, it is the it is the Tyler view from Fight Club, right? You are not a special snowflake, right? And, and exactly. And as CISOs, like when you walk into the room or walk into an organization thinking that and that you're going to somehow change the business practices of the organization you just joined, you you just get your resume ready for the next job already. Like just right. That's right. not you're not there for that. You're there. They brought you mm -hmm. in to help them not make bad decisions or at least make less bad yeah. decisions, right? But you're not there yep. to like completely remove risk. I know the, um, and then we'll get to like the war story component. But the, the thing I loathe about GRC specialists, and I don't mean platforms or technologies. I mean <laughs> folks who are, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, like yes, folks who are former auditors, and nothing wrong with auditors. I love auditors, right? You're my best friends because you're the bad guy that I get to blame when I need budget, right? And I thought I was the bad guy always. But like that GRC specialist view of or analyst view of it's very compliance driven in and somehow they have gotten into security and it's like, well, it's got to be this way. And if it's not, then, you know, we can't do it. It's like, whoa, 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 risk management. Like you're allowed right. to understand and accept risk. In fact, you're not even supposed to do that. It's the business's risk to accept. Yeah. You're yeah. supposed to consult them on what that risk means. It's not up right. to you to actually accept it or not. And if you start yep. thinking that you own all of that risk, oh yep. God, you, oh, that's gotta be a stressful job. That has gotta be a yeah, really- the, audit, the auditor <laughs> has a very black and white existence, right? right. You're, you're either in compliance or you're out of compliance. It's right. a very black and white existence. And the reality is our job is about as gray as it gets. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to your point, risk appetite should be on the table risk acceptance, mitigation, compensating controls. There's a slider bar there. You can you can mitigate it all the way or you can mitigate it partially with compensating controls. And the odds are almost every time that the business, if it's educated properly, understands what its appetite is, understands what the risks are, understands the sliding scale of possible ways of dealing with that risk, almost always is gonna go with compensating controls rather sure. than wholehearted mitigation, almost every single time. Right. Um, and and I, I think the one piece, you know, is we always say this that hey, I don't own the risk. I'm the CISO. The business owns the risk. I, I will say that that if you are a CISO, you're going to be amazingly lucky to stumble into a business whose risk appetite is clearly and well defined and understood by all parties. Mm -hmm. The odds are, as the CISO, you're coaching them on that. Yes, they own it. Right. But if you think they're going to already have that in their pocket when you walk in the door, you're probably in for a bad time. Yeah. Um, so you're you're a consultant, you're a coach. You're here to explain what risk looks like. You're here to translate cyber into business risk, knowing that they already have some business risk models probably. Right. Knowing that they already have e even if they haven't nailed it down and got it written in a document, they've got at least some sense of what their risk appetite is. And I think as CISOs, we have to take whatever those materials are we're given, bring the cyber in our back pocket, meet the two in the middle and coach and advise and and quite quite possibly reshape what the business declares its risk appetite to be. Quite possibly there's going to be a reshaping because of your presence. But that is about the only way I think you should or could expect to change the business as a CISO. Yeah. And it's it's coming through a consultative approach, not a dictatorial approach. Right. Yeah, it's it's so you kind of beat me to one of my war stories around uh, mapped to NIST. So can I go first? Or did you want to go for it? So go for it. Um I'm, I'm I, inoculating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I already finished my uh, Big shout out. I, this is the one thing I'm going to miss this summer if I can't go to it, but uh, it might be backwards on screen from everybody. Actually, I already know it is. Lake Placid Brewery. I'm not sponsored by them, although I probably spent enough money with them that they should be paying me. Um, Lake Placid uh, Brewing Company up in uh, Lake Placid, uh, New York, makes an amazing ale called Ubu Ale. And you'll you'll like this, uh, Oh, Alan. sit, Ubu, sit. It's yeah, it's named after their chocolate lab Ubu, which was like the the dog there, and they named it after yeah. him, and he's now immortalized. Um, phenomenal awesome. beer. Anybody who's ever been up to the Lake Placid region will definitely know where that place is because it's right by the tennis courts. It's a good time. Anyway, um, 
Uh, it's where I it's what I stock up from when I go back north and uh, come back. So, um, yeah, RM ID identif uh, identification risk management two, which is organizational risk tolerance is determined and clearly expressed. I don't know a single company I have ever assessed or worked with that has met that control like off the bat ever. Yep. Right. It's yep. common risk language, a risk register and control library that's linked to business and compliance requirements have been established. N no, no. So like war story wise, I literally could walk into probably any client or any organization I've ever worked in, including the DOD, where the expectation by the business was that was set up. That was in place. Oh, we do that. Oh, we understand what our risk <laughs> is. Yeah. No, we have that really? outlined. Walk and, me through that. Yeah, and then you sit down and you're like, okay, let's talk about that. What is the number one priority to your organization today? What is the number one risk to this organization? And people and I have I've been with select companies and heard six different versions from senior leadership for any one company at a time. And it's the thing that tells me it's the it's one of the first questions I do when I do assessments is I interview the senior leadership and talk about, well, what's your risk tolerance? What's your risk appetite? And what is the number one thing you're trying to protect? Is it brand? Is it IP? Is it reputation? Is it your customer base? Is it a customer specifically? What is it exactly? And it's interesting when everyone in a senior leadership role has a different answer on both of those things. Well, our risk tolerance, you know, the CEO says, oh, our risk tolerance is, you know, we're pretty risk adverse right? We're really conservative in our risk. Like we want to make sure we're doing the right things. Blah, blah, blah. And then you talk to like the CFO and the CTO, <laughs> and then you work your way down to middle management. And it's like, yeah, we just, we just kind of do whatever we need to do to make things work. And you're like, okay, that's cool. And what's really, and it's, you know, I, I laugh about it, but what's nice is from a consulting standpoint, you can sit, so you can sit there and, and come back to everybody at the end and go, look, right, wrong, or indifferent. You guys are not all on the same page. That's a problem. Right. The problem isn't right. that you're that that you all have different views. The problem is that you're not all on the same page. Now, who is going to determine that you should all be on the same page? My opinion is that senior management should establish that, set the tone from the top, and move forward. But they should take the views from everybody else as to like, well, what's actually going to work? If you tell us to go do X, and we've always been doing Y, and Y is what we're able to do, and that's been successful, right. maybe you should think about us allowing us to do Y, right, as part of the risk tolerance. So. But having yep. that clearly expressed from the top, because that's who's running the company, that's who's in charge, that's who's ultimately responsible. But it's just very interesting that, I mean, when you even if you talk sequentially, and NIST isn't supposed to be sequential, but a lot of people just do top straight down, all right? Identify, protect, yep. detect, respond, yep. recover. You don't get past ID. And I think when you shared with me which controls you wanted to talk about, and I shared which ones I wanted to talk about, we didn't get past the identification family as far as what we will have to chat about tonight. So it's interesting that early up front, you have these very set controls on identifying what your risk is, clearly expressing what they are to the organization. Why? Because they're so foundational to everything else that you're going to do, that if you don't have that, don't bother doing a lot of anything on top of it, because it's just going to fail. So not a true war story, but like, it's just something I see as a, as a real theme across a lot of people I work with and talk to. And it's, it's something that's very easy to fix once you just have a conversation about the fact that everybody's on a different page. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and I think it's, it's even deeper than the risk argument. One of the ones I chose, uh, and I'll, I'll read mine very briefly. Excuse me, I chose ID.be business environment. The organization's mission, objectives, stakeholders, and activities are understood and prioritized. This information is used to inform cybersecurity roles, responsibilities, and risk management decisions. Now, now think about that for a moment. You're talking about the risk, not everyone's on the same page. Right. I'm getting even more fundamental than that, and I'm saying what the actual business is there to do. We don't even have people on the same page, yeah. right? It's, it's amazing to me. Um, Take, take two fundamental things that every business in theory has. One is a mission statement and one is a vision statement, mm -hmm. right? And ask the CEO and the CFO and the CRO, et cetera, et cetera, just for your story, ask all these folks and work your way all the way down into middle management. What's the mission and what's the vision? And unless the business truly publicizes those and broadcasts them constantly and regularly, you're not even going to get the same answer for those two. Sure. What's your mission versus what's your vision and what's the difference between the two? You can't even get clarity there. So if you can't get clarity there, 
uh, trying to get clarity for risk is like a, a secondary phenomenon even from that, right? I, I think you've got to get the business on page with what it's there to do before you can get it on, on the same page with what it's, what it's, you know, thinking about in terms of the risks to what it wants to do. Right. So I, I've got, and I've got war stories there. Um, I have, I have more than once now been in a business where I've asked that basic question. What are we here to do? What's the actual mission? What's the vision? Where do we want to be? Mm -hmm. And where are we now? What is it we're focused on and what is it we're doing and what are we prioritizing? And you get five different answers from the leadership of the company as to what the vision and the mission are. So step one, I think, is identify that. Sure. Get your mission, get your vision. And like you said, bring everyone to the same table and say, guys, we're not getting the same answer to a very basic question here. So let's get on board with that and figure out what that basic basic answer is. Get our mission, get our vision, right? Mm -hmm. So start with that. Then from there, I think we get into what you talked about. Let's talk about how the risk program now actually feeds and informs that. Right. Because because the the business mission is what's being impacted when we talk about any kind of risk. Sure. A risk is a risk to the business mission. So start with BE, move into RM, uh, and then from there, very quickly, I think AM has to happen next. And that's, of course, my other war story. <laughs> it's, I've got some tales I can share about uh, asset management. But I think I think understanding the business mission first understanding the risk to that mission second, and then understanding the assets and how they actually fulfill right. that business mission so that you can speak to them in terms of risk is, is third. I like, I like that asset management. is always my, uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite, right? Critical security control number one and two. It's right. The earliest control set inside of NIST CSF. I, I, yep. my go-to saying is always, I can't defend what I don't know exists. Right. So it's yep. like, you, you, you have to do that. And that translates to people. So, my other my other control and I'll I'll share this is actually two. It's IDAM six, which is mm -hmm. cybersecurity roles and responsibilities for the entire workforce and third party stakeholders. Yes. right are established. Yes. Now, what we did see come out with uh, hey, what's up, Rich Mason? Uh, thanks for chiming in. And Chris Carter, uh, definitely a good paraphrase of Mike Wilkes, right from uh, ASCAP. Right, we're not in the business of deploying security; we're in the business of securing the business. Uh, if I paraphrase yeah. that right, um, the uh, the ID a uh, AM right the what came out with NIST CSF now right version one one the introduction of the entire third the new third party controls right because they went from ninety eight they added ten controls there's five of those controls I think if I remember correctly five or six of those controls squarely on supply chain but taking supply chain aside and I have an entirely yeah. different discussion I'll link. Yes. down somewhere here where I broke down all of the NIST controls outside of the newly added uh, con uh, supply chain controls that actually talk mm -hmm. about supply chain. So it's funny, NIST 1.0 already had this entire set of controls inside of the framework to uh, to tackle supply chain um, right. so that cyber. But I'm glad that NIST came out and just said, oh, here's a whole new subfamily make sure you definitely explicitly hit it. explicitly right. to address just, exactly. just like yeah and and be should be there as an explicit to address but at the same time it's the overlay for all of it right it's, it's the same it's the same analogy exactly so so the one for six is is this is an interesting one and, and partly why probably our company now exists um because the role of the CISO doesn't exist for everyone right we know that it's it's an expensive role right we're not cheap i get that but cyber doesn't change as far as the impact and the need as you go downstream to smaller and smaller companies. Now, why I find that really interesting is not because this war story is from a smaller company, but from a much larger organization somewhere in the Fortune 500. Um, being a NIST guy, I was hired, being a NIST guy, knew full well what I was lined up for as far as what I wanted to do as far as bringing that framework to an organization inside of the, the, the top fortune uh, space. Brand new minted corporate C CISO in a role. Mm -hmm. Third day on the job, I get to sit down with the CEO. Seems reasonable. I was expecting it. I was excited. I get to sit down and chat with, uh, chat with the CEO about the expectations. Wanted to take him through my thoughts initially. Get his thoughts on, on how things were going to go. Um, the role, the responsibility of the CISO. The embracement now of security as it was kind of new to the organization at the time with the role being established. Yep. Um, and lo and behold, five minutes into the conversation, I'm stopped dead in my discussion with, look, 
I don't even actually know why we have this role here. Like, what is it that we actually need to focus on security for? Why do we need a CISO? And I'm sitting there like, I just sold Didn't my house just and me? moved here. <laughs> like, like, are you kidding me? But the CEO was so disconnected from probably the business needs and the demands that the board executive leadership had seen because he wasn't the one who hired me. It was the board's right. pressure on right. another gentleman right. who hired me rightfully. Mm -hmm. And I applaud them for that. And it was interesting to see how much longer that CEO was actually with the organization, something like three more months. Um, interesting. Because the, the organization itself did understand, to your point, in your control, right, what its business mission was, what its risk mm -hmm. management tolerance was, and the way that the current leadership of the organization was leading it was not inside of either of those. And right, they decided right. we need security leadership to focus in right. on this area to bring us to the next level to ensure that we are doing. Now, this is way this is this is probably five, you know, it's about five, six years ago. This was kind of still new. Like Matt Combs had just wrote that article about CISOs in the corporate space. Now I get mm -hmm. Steve Katz, right? First CISO way back, yeah, right? Yeah. Guys have done yeah, some yeah. some amazing, crazy stuff. But but now in like then, it still wasn't fully embraced by I think a lot of organizations. Now you've been around, you know, doing this, right? You and, and, and a lot of other guys that I've looked up to and read about for a long, long time. But I don't think it trickled down to like the rest of like the Fortune 1000 that they needed to like yeah. have this role. So it was interesting yeah. to kind of see that all shape up. And that was like, and that was the view. And then after the fact, kind of like after he left and new CEO came in and took the company in a, in a brand, in a, in a great direction, right? They did great. Um, it was really evident to me why that conversation took place then and why that thinking mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. versus if I had been brought in a year or two years later, it would have been an entirely different conversation from the CEO, one of right. embracement and like, right. oh my God, thank, like we totally need to do this. Like I understand. And it wasn't, and what, and at first it was like, and, and I'll, I'll cut this, but like, at first I was like, man, I suck. Like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> like I just, I haven't sold my job. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting there like, wow, am I really not supposed to be here? Like, am I really not qualified to do this role? Like, wow, I'm not, but it wasn't, he wasn't saying anything about me. Brian, he just didn't understand the position of the role and what the role brought, why the role was needed, or why even the focus on cybersecurity was as paramount as it was to the rest of the organization. And that's what gave me like, go, oh, okay, okay, I don't, I don't suck at life. Like, all right, it's, right, it's, right. I, like, that gave me some <laughs> solace, but it was just. After a brief visit with imposter syndrome, you return to your job. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, I, we all go through that. But it was, it was yeah. interesting. I kind of always go back to that, especially when I talk to people when they're like, well, I don't know if I need this or not. And I always think back to that moment when I'm like, you're going to probably change your tune at some point where you're going to go, I do need yeah. this. How do I make yeah. you see why this control, right, uh, AM6 is is something that you need to focus in on, making sure that you actually have the roles and responsibilities established. Because I don't think cybersecurity is going away anytime soon. Nope. Nope. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I, and I've, I've learned to play the what-if game a lot upstairs. And, I, and I've got a similar story to yours. It wasn't a CEO. It was a private equity buyout. Um, similar sort of situation where, hey, do we even need this anymore? It's kind of expensive. We're looking at the books. You know, right. CISOs look expensive. Um, and, and, and you end up having to ultimately play in my mind, the what if game, you know, what, you know, you start with a, what, what is the most valuable to you? Again, back to BE, they better know BE. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they know BE. If you're talking to the CEO, even if no one else in the company has the same vision he does, he's got a vision in his back pocket. Yep. I know what my BE is. Okay. Talk to me about that. Now we're going to play the what if game. What if the bad things happens and you can't make the revenue through this one client? Oh, what if that client's sensitive information is leaked mm -hmm. and you lose that client? Right. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And you walk them through all the what ifs. And this isn't the same thing as, as fear mongering, right? We talk all the time as, yeah. as good CISOs. We shouldn't be using FUD, right? We should be playing the what if game. That That is our job is the what if game. I, I wake up every morning and think about what if and, and how do I tackle the what if, right? right? That's what I do for a living. And that's what you want to get the CEO on board with you and doing or the board or whomever it might be. That's the obstacle in this case. And you, 
so you you have to start with that business mission awareness and once you've got that in hand you can start talking about all the bad things that could happen to disrupt derail sidetrack marginalize or reduce that business mission mm -hmm. and you bring those stories to bear and then you say this is what i'm here for we're going to work through all these possible bad situations right we're going to go through them together i'm going to bring you guys guidance and suggestions uh, you guys are going to decide whether my advice is worth the risk, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's really, it's a value proposition. At the end of the day, give me $10,000 and I'll fix this $2,000 risk is not going to be a story that sells. Right. But give me $2,000 and I'll fix your $10,000 risk is a story that's going to sell. Yep. And it all starts with that business mission and business awareness. And and I think, uh, you know, even, even today, there are companies operating without a CISO. Um, it's foolhardy. It is definitely foolhardy. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, you're going to get burned because information security and information technology are far too integral to every business mission now. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your, your BE is going to get fulfilled in a number of ways by technology. This is why you have asset management as a, as a rapid follow-up. Is you know, It's impossible today to achieve anything without information technology. And you know, it's not just about the information technology. It's about the data itself. Mm -hmm. At this point, you know, there's all these analogies and stories people love to throw around. Data is the new oil and whatever else it might be. Um, the reality is data is a commodity and a currency for your business, and there's no way you're fulfilling your business mission without exchanging data. Right. And if that data is lost, compromised, or stolen, it's the same thing as saying any other currency you're exchanging as part of your business is lost, you know, damaged, or stolen. Right. So – it's critical, and and I'm with your point fully. I I think I think the folks who don't get the role will soon. Mm -hmm. But I also think back to the taking responsibility for ourselves as CISOs. I think part of our job is to educate on that role. Sure. Part of what every CISO is doing is selling the value of why there's a CISO in the first place. Similar to the way a, a CMO is marketing internally and externally for the company, right? A CMO, if 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 she's doing her job, she's not, or he. It, it, she's she's going to be pushing not just the marketing message that goes outside for the company's products and or services. Mm -hmm. She's pushing the message internal to the organization to appreciate and understand the value of the business mission, the vision, the products, the services, et cetera. And I think a CISO has a similar burden, except the CMO is not having to market himself. Right. Right. You're, you're because CMO is already company. a long established and built in role. Right. I think the CISO is not only having to market why security matters, both externally and internally, but also why the CISO matters <laughs> externally right. and internally. Why does it exist? We're still selling ourselves. Yeah. Every CISO is a salesman. Every successful CISO right. is also a salesman. Yeah, I, I've I've always kind of a, aligned the the role itself as the CIO's emergence from telecom and IT's emergence from telecom years ago, right? Mm -hmm. CISOs and IT secure and and cybersecurity, IT security. If you're inside of the DoD or the government, you call it information assurance, or just infosec if you're that old. Rainbow series, um, that whole that we're still emerging from IT, right? And 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 not only are we emerging from IT, we are emerging out of that space, but also trying to get aligned to legal or the risk management, uh, or you know the 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 risk the risk officer, the chief risk officer, um, and and that's that's actually my um, my other control, which I find interesting, which I find a lot of folks when I talk to. Because I get a lot of questions. I'm sure you do too. Like, hey, I want to be a CISO. How do I go do this? Like, what should I think about going trajectory down the cyber, you know, path, career path? What should I go after? And the the other one being uh, ID, still an ID one, GV two, mm -hmm. where information security roles and responsibilities are coordinated and lined with internal and external partners. So where um, BE or A, I'm sorry, AM six is does the role mm -hmm. exist? Do you have yep. the team governance, right? And and I'll say that after you kind of have all these things, you better be governing them to some degree. So I would put a big, mm -hmm. big mark yes. on that. Yes. How are you now taking you as a CISO, if you're you know a party of one, a uh, team of one, or a team of twenty or whatever? How are you aligning what you're doing and your responsibility to the rest of the organization? Because if you're only looking at and talking to and interacting with IT, you're missing. A lot. Even if you're only interacting with IT and the business, you're still missing mm -hmm. internal audit, general counsel, yep. and your legal yep. team, your HR, HR teams, your marketing teams, your PR teams. Yep. There are all these, even facilities, right? Like physical physical securities is a missed opportunity for CISOs to kind yep. of get into. Like lose the eye, 
gain a whole nother team, right? Become the CSO. Right. It's a fun job. Right. Um, it is a fun job. I've done physical. It's fun. Yeah, it is cool. You know, the great, the best use case is, hey, give me badge data and give me VPN traffic and let me see what's going on there. Let's cross-reference those two data points. Yes. That's always let's put a stuff. UEBA on that and actually flag an alert for weird stuff. Right? Like, let's like, do it. Yeah, that's always a good you. one. I'm with you. But the, that, the GV2 is, is all, gov governance is all about your alignment with these internal and external partners. Do you have a major vendor or supplier that that you rely on, right? Do you even know who they are as a CISO? Does your team know who they are? Do you realize the yep. interdependency of your mm -hmm. organization to that supplier and vice versa? The data, not, and I'm talking beyond- Cough, cough, target. Right, yeah, I'm talking beyond <laughs> just like what data access do you have? What access into our organization do you have? I'm talking about pure business reliance and revenue. So yeah, case, absolutely. In, case in point, how many organizations have recently gone through this exercise in the last 10 weeks where they said, oh, well, we're just going to fall back to our operations in India or Singapore because everyone's work from home. We have business disruption here in the States. We'll just fall back to those. Yeah. Did you think a global pandemic wasn't impacting the rest of the globe? <laughs> like hmm. Singapore and India aren't exactly in the best position right now, but neither is the U.S. Right. Everybody's right. in this together. So... Right. How aligned are you to your external partners? And I, I just I find that that's one that's like clearly missed, and that's an that's yeah. a it's an yeah. easy win for a CISO and a security team to just embrace because now you've created another ally, right? Even if it's yep. external, but internal. Like when you got to, we all get called to yep. the boardroom and we got to talk about the bad stuff and the good stuff. How many times would you rather have other people in the boardroom there with you who are on your side? already know your right. story and are waiting to right. raise their hand and go, you know what, what he's asking for, she's asking for, we should approve that in the budget because that is yep. going to address the risk that that person talked about, that person talked about, that thing that I've been talking about for three years. You want right. those allies. Right. And by not yes, creating did. them, you're just missing yes, an did. opportunity. And, and it's not just about building the alliances either. It's also about, you know, back to the BE, it's back to that knowledge, your, your original story of talk to talk to the CEO about the risk, talk mm -hmm. to the CFO and CRO about the risk, talk to the middle management about the risk, get all these different stories. There's a there's a big picture miss here if you're not constantly working the entire ecosystem, right? And one of my one of my horrible tales is from AM. Um, you know, lesson learned early in my career. Everyone knows that you talk to the execs to get buy-in at the big level and to get an understanding at the big level, but if you want to understand how things really work, you got to go. You got to go downstairs, right? You got to right. start talking to the folks that are actually doing the doing to, to learn the ins and outs. Similarly, you can talk to the doers about the ins and outs all day long, but never get the traction of their leadership and never get the win. So sure. ultimately, you have to always have both, right? And and a good lesson I had on the you must always have both. I had built a cybersecurity council. It was comprised of vice presidents and above from all over the company. To your point, we had HR, we had legal, we had everybody on board that needed to be on board, VP and above. And we started making some decisions in that council, in that committee. And one of those decisions had to do with our asset management. And we started launching entire programs back to, you know, uh, identify, detect, protect, respond, recover, or, you know, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Um, we were nailing identify and chugging on straight to protect. And we started building programs and, and machinations and automation and tools and kit and everything around uh, protecting what we had already identified in our committee and our council as the assets to be identified in the council. And I'm halfway through a protect cycle and happened to bump into somebody in middle management. And I'm mentioning like, oh yeah, we're taking your whole blah, blah system. And we're, we're chugging through this and we're protecting that. And we're protecting that. And he goes, well, what about the blah, blah? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean the blah blah? <laughs> and he starts he starts naming not just a machine or two, but entire ecosystems of assets oh. that the VPs and above had utterly failed to capture. So here I am with this totally representative committee. Whoops. And excited that I've got every bit, you know, everybody's bought in and everyone's invested and involved. I've got active participation. I've got every nook and cranny of the company. VP and above <laughs> bought in and excited and thrilled. And here we were missing entire swaths mm, of the business yeah, because we didn't trickle it below the VP level. And I was so focused on reaching out that I forgot to reach down in that instance. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's really important as you form a VP and above cybersecurity council, which I still say is an absolute necessity. 
do the whip arounds, check in with their teams, have them propagate, push down to their orgs and bring back up what their orgs generate and produce. Don't rely on the leadership of the company to know the details of the company, like, like never fall for that trap. Some yeah. of them may be very confident, uh, but that doesn't mean they actually truly know every system that's out there. And I've got other tales of the exact same problem starting at the bottom and failing to make it up. Sure where everybody at the grassroots was on board and then leadership totally didn't get a, a, or, or threw in a wrench about an entire business process integration that everybody in the, you know, the, the people that maintain and run this ecosystem of computers or whatever it might be, don't necessarily know what the big picture business plugin might be. You've got to work up and down the food chain at all times. You right? do. Rookie mistake on my part years ago, uh, but a lesson well learned and one I've taken with me every place I've ever been since. You know what's interesting? I uh, big shout out to uh, to Terrence Jackson on uh, online right now. Uh, he says, "Hey, Terrence. We uh, apparently we're two of his favorite infosec people. Well, that's thanks, Terrence. Um, and Sean and Rich Mason, right? Oh, the living legend, Rich Mason chimed in on uh, Rich, risk coach. Put me in. Leaders should have a risk budget the same way they have a financial budget and schedule authorizations. Yeah, I definitely." Definitely agree. Um, you know, on, on the point that you were just making, um, one story I had, and I didn't even think about this till just now, like n who I didn't talk to. Here's a, mm -hmm. here's a huge miss that I made, right? Um, we were looking to implement multi-factor authentication, right? And if people aren't out there, go implement MFA. We were looking to do it for large-scale enterprise. I worked with IT directly, figured out what was going on, understood the nuances, made the case, got them to buy in, but they were reluctant to do it because of their previous, um, you know, impacts of rolling out um, systems and, you know, other types of authentications, right? They were a little gun shy. And I, I understood that. But what I failed to do was think beyond that. I took that opinion and said, oh, okay, well, we really, we really have to worry about that. And I started trying to change IT's leadership uh, their mind on why we needed to do this. And that's where I thought I had to put my focus on was the IT leadership of the organization and making them understand. And I did. It was an uphill battle. What I failed to do and fully realize was and talk to the actual impacted populace of the company, all the rest of the users outside of IT. And you know what I learned? We did a quick survey. We did some desk side chats. I literally did stuff in lunchrooms and just talked to folks and just reached out. Every single one of them. Oh, that thing that I do with my bank? Yeah, that's not a problem. That That's easy. We can do yeah. that. I can totally right, do that. Right. That's not going to be an issue. Right. Every single end user outside of IT. Mm -hmm. My failure was not going to the people who were actually impacted and getting their opinion. I thought mm -hmm. the opinion of one part of the organization was the opinion of the rest of it. Yep. And that was my failure. And I, I lost so much time because of that. We've yep. successfully yep. rolled out the entire, the entire thing anyway, but that lesson learned has stuck with me forever. Yep. Um, up, down and out, just, right? Every calm, every input stream, every output stream, up, down and out, up, listen down to and your out, users. up, down and out. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you have to you have to bring them all in you have to and 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 it's amazing too even on a departmental basis how many different stories you'll get right you'll you'll find like you said like the entire it organization feels one way about it and you'll go talk to hr and they've got a completely different opinion mm -hmm. positive or negative that that can go either either direction right and and so you have to you have to do the full whip around you have to right right yeah you got it don't stop. I think that's what I learned was like, don't like yep. once you just keep going for, I used to have one thing. I don't know if you've ever done this, but like I, I always had fun. Um, I used to make a point to eat lunch with the DBAs and, um, yes. back in the D back in the DOD, it was, uh, I made a point to not just eat lunch with the DBAs, but the storage admins. Cause I had a, 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 a nice long, very prosperous stint as a, a storage admin inside the DOD. And you want to talk about the people who know, where everything is in an organization. Mm -hmm. Ask the DBA. Mm -hmm. Those people, they, they should be paid twice what they are. They're probably the ones yeah. who will be working yeah. on Friday night restoring the entire business to what it, what it was, right? right? It's not, it's not right. your sales guys, it's them. But learning from them and asking them because they see just about everything, that mm -hmm. is an insight that is, oh, it's worth its weight in gold. Yep, um, yep. 
very yep. very impactful find, find those find those those uh those funneling roles right because they're everywhere it's not just your dbas it's also your um your employment attorneys right mm -hmm. the look, look for the folks in legal that specialize in employment they're they're right there you can get both hr and legal in in one container Right. You know, look, look for those roles that funnel multiple things through a through an individual, through a through a role and, and hone in on those and collect friends in those places. Yeah. Right. And, and then treat them as your as your test test audience. Right. Mm -hmm. And it might only cost you every a free, it might only cost you a lunch. Right. Exactly. Or, or exactly. a cookie. Bring. <laughs> yep. Bring them in. Bring them in. Feed them pizza. Get their opinions before you even start to roll out. Well, Alan, this is uh, it's almost the top of the hour. We've I think we've had a great discussion. We've had a pretty good amount of people coming on. Thanks for everybody chiming in. Brian Kuhn, Dele, uh, let's jump in here. Oh, Malik, thanks for uh, thanks for dropping in, saying hi, and Terrence again. Um, so awesome. hopefully we can we can have another war story session. Uh, we'll we'll probably try to migrate out of the identification family and see what we can do. I know I've got a ton like of it. Got a ton of stories and protect and detect that we could yeah. go oh, into. <laughs> Terrence has a great comment here about he had to find champions, right? Champions is really that's that's where you want to get these folks evolved to. Yep. You, you want to find people of influence, and influence does not necessarily mean leadership rank. No, right? Definitely not. Influence is anybody who's a true influencer. You'll find that the influencers are often not the people with rank. It's the guy that's been there 25 years and sits in the corner and everyone knows who he is, right? right. That's the guy you want to win over. Um, find those champions, spread them around, and again, up, down, out, all directions, right? Very true. Very true. Fantastic comment. And we will, uh, I don't know, maybe I can entice you to come back, uh, come back on the show. Uh, next time we'll find some, we'll find some other, uh, controls. Uh, here's a, here's a thought. If anybody out there watching right now, and we'll edit this and publish it again, if you didn't catch it live, um, throw a comment down below and what NIST CSF version one, one control would you like uh alan and i to dig into the depths of our paths and brains to discuss and maybe we can get some other uh uh security superstars such as yourself on here to uh to share their uh anonymized war stories i think that'd be interesting because the only way that we collectively and each learn from this stuff i think is from each other um, because it is such a new field um and you know it, it only helps to you know learn from guys like you uh, about what's been going on, what didn't work, yeah. so that I don't make that mistake when I go in and do it. You know, we could do a whole show on Alan's history of screw-ups. <laughs> <laughs> There's the new bumper right there. Dun, dun, dun. Alan's history of screw-ups. That should be its own podcast. I'll just rattle off everything I ever did wrong. People can take notes and hopefully not make the same mistakes. I love it. I love it. Alan, always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, glad to see you're doing well. Uh, keep, uh, keep Texas being Texas. And uh, right on. we will uh, we'll catch up with you next time. This is uh, so I don't know if you want to say any closing words and I'll sign us off. I'm, I'm good here. Thank you for having me on the show. I've always wanted to join up with you guys. Uh, appreciate what you do for the community. Um, Side channel, I know, is a is a is a booming, bolstering business. Folks should uh, look into if they're looking for CISO advice. And um, yeah, glad to be here. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for a shout out. Hey, Brian Hoagley with CISO Life. Thanks again for watching. Uh, keep washing those hands. Keep your head up. Reach out to your neighbors, your friends. Make sure everybody's doing good. Take care, and we'll see you next time, all right? Thanks. Bye.